Okay, we have time for a few questions. Uh, Wall Street Journal. Um, Mr. Stoltenberg, um, I wondered if uh, you would uh, talk a little bit more about the military mobility and what you want to see out of uh, the EU. Is this about creating standards for roads and bridges um, so that they can take uh, uh, an American tank, say? Uh, how can uh, the EU sort of speed up this sort of movement. And for the high representative, um, did you hear what you wanted to hear today from Mr. Tillerson on, on the Iran nuclear deal? Do you, do you take his comments about fully enforcing the deal as in some way a signal that the U.S. Uh, will stand by it? So military mobility is about uh, the need to be able to move uh, forces quickly across uh, Europe. Uh, so that's partly about uh, addressing some of the legal hurdles, uh, some of the bureaucratic hurdles we will face when we, for instance, cross uh, borders, but also other regulations. And that's partly nations and partly EU as an institution that has to address those legal uh, hurdles. Uh, then uh, military mobility is about uh, infrastructure, meaning that we need the roads, the bridges, the tunnels, uh, and the harbors and the airports which are able then to receive and then uh, uh, frame or, or, or to facilitate uh, the transportation of uh, heavy uh, equipment and, uh, and uh, supplies. Um, during the Cold War, NATO developed many uh, uh, standards uh, uh, addressing these uh, challenges. But we have to remember that very big parts of Europe were not member of NATO. They were member of the Warsaw Pact. So, of course, these standards never applied for that part of Europe. And second, NATO countries have not been so very focused on this since the end of the Cold War. So now we have to again look into how can we make sure that at least we have some transport corridors where we are able to transport heavy equipment, including equipment from outside Europe, from uh, the United States, Canada, and uh, and, uh, and other non-EU uh, uh, member states. So uh, this is also about standards uh, and making sure that we have the infrastructure in place that can is receive and transport uh, uh, the um, equipment and the forces uh, we need. And it's also about making sure that we have the um, transportation assets. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, many of these assets were state-owned. Now, much of it has been privatized, for instance, uh, railroad uh, companies. Uh, so therefore, we need to engage with the private sector, make sure that we have these uh, assets uh, available uh, if uh, uh, needed. Ships, uh, 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 so uh, trucks and, uh, and different other uh, uh, planes and of, uh, other means of transportation. So there is a wide range of issues that has to be addressed. We have started to work, our staffs have started to address them, to identify the gaps, uh, to compare information, and it will be a combination of nations, EU and NATO, that has to develop and uh, to uh, solve uh, the challenges we, we face when it comes to uh, military uh, mobility. Yeah. My answer is very short, yes. <laughs> okay. Then we'll see the follow-up. Uh, NPR Deutsche Welle, fourth row, lady in the fourth row. Hi, thank you, Terry Schultz with NPR and Deutsche Welle. Um, for both of you, please. Um, what did you make of uh, the German foreign minister's comments coming into this meeting, saying that um, U.S. leadership is, is crumbling, that the U.S. seems to see Europe as a, a competitor um, rather than a partner sometimes, and is pursuing policies that um, might be hurting its all allies rather than helping? I'm interested in both of your reaction. Thank you. Well, um, um, Minister uh, Sigmar Gabriel also stated very clearly that uh, he doesn't see uh, European defense as an alternative to NATO. He is uh, strongly in favor of a strong transatlantic uh, uh, bond. And that's exactly the message from Federica and from me. This is not about creating something which uh, is going to compete with NATO, but this is something that is going to be uh, complementary and to strengthen uh, uh, NATO. Then I think we have to remember that NATO is an alliance of 29 different nations, democracies. And there are uh, very often different views on different issues. Uh, and they are discussed among allies, among friends. Uh, and uh, sometimes so we see that there are uh, disagreements also about uh, issues related to foreign policy, environment, trade, and many other issues. But the strength of NATO is that we have been able again and again to prove 
that despite of these differences, we are always able to agree on the core task of NATO. And that is that we are uh, there to protect each other, that our collective defense is the best way to uh, ensure peace. And uh, the Article 5, uh, uh, the collective defense clause, that an attack on one ally will trigger the response from the whole alliance. And I know that Sigmar Gabriel is very clear on this, uh, as is all other uh, allies. Let me also add that we see that the United States is actually increasing their presence uh, in Europe. Uh, we have more troops. Uh, we have uh, more equipment, we have more U.S. exercises now. After years of decline after the Cold War, uh, the U.S. has started to increase their presence, and they're also increasing funding for the European uh, Deterrence Initiative uh, to close to 5 billion U.S. dollars. So it is more funding from the United States. There are more troops, more equipment. So I think that just underlines that the United States is committed uh, to the transatlantic bond, uh, the United States is not leaving Europe, actually it's coming back to Europe, also with Canada. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I welcome the leadership of the United States in the alliance. And I met with Secretary Tillerson, uh, and he uh, reiterated uh, his ironclad uh, commitment to the alliance, and the US uh, uh, ironclad commitment to the alliance. So, we are an alliance of 29 democracies, sometimes of different views, but we agree on the core task that we are there to protect each other. On the European Union side, uh, um, obviously we are in a different position because we are a political union of 28 uh, um, also democracies. Uh, and we have with the United States uh, not a relationship of alliance, uh, but of partnership and friendship. And this is a common basis that uh, unites us not only for our history, but also for the future perspectives of uh, uh, trying to handle together uh, some of the challenges the world is facing and trying to get some of the opportunities the world is offering. And this is still the solid basis of uh, the transatlantic friendship and partnership between the European Union and the United States. I particularly appreciated the fact that today uh, Secretary Tillerson, uh, before coming here, spent uh, three hours, three good hours, I would say, first in a bilateral meeting with me, and then with all the 28 foreign ministers of the member states of the European Union, paying an official visit to the European Union institutions, as President Trump and Vice President Pence already did earlier this year. And this is clearly a sign of recognition of our partnership, not only in the framework of NATO as a military alliance, this is not my... Uh, business is as if, I, as European, obviously, I have a specific interest in that working well, uh, but of the US-EU as such partnership. Uh, we had excellent meeting today. There are many issues on which we work together, and if we were not working together, um, the security situation in large parts of the world would be much worse than the one we're facing today. Um, if you think of DPRK, uh, if you think of Afghanistan, if you think of Syria, and I could continue, Libya, um, some crises in Africa, uh, and again, I could continue a long list, counterterrorism, uh, anti-Daesh, um, Ukraine, and again, the list is long. There are many files on which our cooperation is vital, is vital, and is achieving results. There are other areas on which the European Union and the United States have different positions on foreign policy. And we're very open and frank about that, very candid. And today also around the table in, in, uh, on the other side of Brussels in the EU institutions, uh, we had a very frank discussion about this, as friends do. Recognizing the different arguments, recognizing the different positions is what allows us to understand each other's position, respect them, but also trying to avoid mistakes or uh, trying to find a way to cooperate uh, even when positions are different. I don't think you want a list of issues on which our positions uh, are um, different. You know them. One was uh, the nuclear deal with Iran, where the European Union and its member states made very clear the fact that for us it's a strategic priority that matters to our security, a nuclear deal that is working and that has been certified nine times by the A as working, needs to be preserved, especially as we're facing another nuclear proliferation crisis uh, further east. Um, but also for the overall um, credibility of international negotiations and agreements. And the message was heard, I think, loud and clear in Washington. And I think that today we are uh, in a better place when it comes to 
the commitment uh, to um, stay uh, compliant with the agreement uh, and work together to keep Iran compliant with the agreement, which is um, our major common um, work to be um, done. Uh, we have a, different of views, a difference of views when it comes to multilateralism and in particular the UN system. Uh, we are, uh, as the European Union, the strongest supporters of the UN system and uh, a rules-based global order that includes the investment in UN peacekeeping, um, something we share, by the way, with another transatlantic partner that is uh, um, also very much a friend, Canada. Uh, but also, uh, for us, this involves uh, a trade uh, and uh, upcoming WTO ministerial uh, next week in uh, Argentina will also be um, a test uh, for the way in which we see uh, international relations. This uh, uh, was evident on the climate change agreement uh, and, uh, well, I was personally sad and this was also shared today by other uh, European Union uh, member states ministers that the United States decided to leave the global compact of the United Nations on migration and refugees. We believe and we invest in multilateral mechanisms and systems and we wish to do this more and more with the United States. This is the way we take to foreign policy and security policy as well. There's another issue we mentioned briefly today, even with the press, of uh, um, difference of views, maybe, uh, let's see. Uh, we in Europe believe that uh, the only perspective for peace and security for Israel and Palestine is the two-state solution, not out of idealism, but out of experience. We believe this is the only realistic option for both and for the region. Uh, and we are uh, in good company in believing that, uh, and namely uh, the Arab Peace Initiative uh, that we still believe is a useful framework for finding a solution to the crisis, uh, to the conflict, um, is still a very useful framework as we believe that any move uh, that could derail the possibility of relaunching talks, for instance, moves around Jerusalem, would be detrimental uh, in immediate terms and in the perspective of reopening diplomatic uh, process uh, in the Middle East. So we have differences, uh, but we uh, have more things on which we work in a cooperative manner. Uh, and even on the points on which we have differences, we put as a priority uh, the candid, open, frank conversation. Um, not frank and constructive as uh, uh, journalists mean it, uh, but as we mean it, <laughs> we human beings <laughs> mean it, meaning positive uh, and looking for common ground and common action to be taken. Um, very respectful and uh, uh, always in a sense of friendship. Okay, the Pobeda from Montenegro. Uh, 23 of 28 EU member states have recently signed an agreement about uh, joint military investment. Uh, so did you discuss about uh, that today? And does that me, uh, represent an alternative to, to NATO in Europe? Uh, no, but I think oh. Federica can say more about no. the EU. Yeah. <laughs> I can say yeah. the same. Yeah. No, you, you mean the, the military uh, command? Yeah. yeah, no, not at all. Uh, we, uh, that was one of the big uh, uh, taboos. Uh, it's simply the fact that uh, the European Union has already uh, ongoing uh, military and civilian uh, missions and operations. We have 16 of them. Only in Africa we have more than 10,000 men and women serving um, under EU flag. And it only makes sense from a military point of view, uh, by the way also from a civilian point of view, to have uh, one command structure. And here in NATO this is perfectly understood. It's a matter of making the most out of the already existing um, missions and operations we have. It's a matter of making them work better with a, main, with, a, with a streamlined chain of command. And this is not at all and will never be uh, a way of creating a shape kind of structure. Uh, it is clear, crystal clear, uh, that we are not looking at duplications. We are not looking at ways to turn the European Union into a military alliance but we are looking at make the most out of the instruments we have, including some of our defense instruments. But there's no, comp no competition, only complementarity, and no ambition to turn the European Union into, um, into a military alliance. We stay a political union with some defense instruments that we are trying to use at their best. I'm afraid that's all we have time for because the minister's dinner will start very soon. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.